The Senate Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Vice Chair Orenshaw. Here. Senator Gorkachia. Here. Senator Daly. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Chair Flores. Present. Uh, thank you. Please let the record reflect. All members are present. We have a quorum. Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to the very hardworking Committee on Government Affairs. A uh, couple of things. I want to remind folks to silence your cell phones. Also, all of us are in the middle of presenting bills and or in other hearings and or I need to get back to a work session. Uh, Senator Goykachia needs to get to finance a little bit later today. That is just a long-winded way of saying we're going to be walking in and out of committee throughout our four bill presentations. Please do not take that as a sign of disrespect. Um, unfortunately, just it's the nature of these last several weeks in this building. Um, for those of you following along, I, I want to remind everybody we're going to take Assembly Bill 333 first, followed by Assembly Bill 262, followed by Assembly Bill 33, and then lastly, Assembly Bill 378, um, just for those of you particularly our attachés so that you can notify the corresponding Assembly members so that they can make their way to the room uh, whenever their bill is up. Uh, again, I will at some point be walking out as um, Senate Education has a work session document that we have to take care of today, and obviously I need to be back there for that vote. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 333. Assemblywoman Duran, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. And I know you guys are probably just as hard as working as we are in government affairs. And I've learned it from the chair because he was my chairman for the last two previous sessions. So I know how hard we do all work. Anyway, my name is B. Duran. I represent uh, Assembly District 11 in Clark County. And thank you for the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 333, which revises provisions governing housing authorities. Joining me today is Mindy Elliott, Elliot, excuse me, oh, sorry, didn't mean That's to right. butcher your name, Senior Vice President of Flynn Judici. Over Zoom, we have Mahogany Tuffley and Fred Har Harmon from the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, who will be helping me go over the bill and answer any questions from committee members. I bring this bill to you today because your home is your castle. You should be able to live in your house that is safe and comfortable and a place that you should be able to raise your family with dignity and respect. Make special memories with your family, friends, and loved ones. A place that you should be proud of regardless if you own your home, renting an apartment, live in a senior community, or even in public housing. If you, even if you live in Summerlin, Ham, uh, Henderson, North Las Vegas, Boulder City, or in East Las Vegas, or even in an indigenous community, your home is your safe place. I bring this bill before you today because of personal experience. My dad is living in a senior community for over 20 years, and his house has never been painted, never had a full inspection of his appliances, never had a sink check, they never looked under the sink for wood rot, his counters haven't even been looked at. Until we recently complained that his faucets were full of calcium buildup, we could barely move the faucet from one side to one side of the sink to the other. They did replace that all though. With having a how to start, with having a how to a housing shortages, these homes and apartments should be taken care of so that the owners and re residents have a safe home and even if an owner finds that the work needs to be done or things need to be replaced or fixed, they can fix the necessary issues in a timely manner and it won't cost them an arm and a leg to keep their property from being dilapidated and becoming uninhabitable. There have been many complaints from my constituents about some of their living conditions and there is nothing in statute to hold owners accountable. These, con these complaints go unheard and the owners continue to ignore them and there is not much they can do. The cost of moving to one apartment, of moving to other apartments, deposits, background checks, credit reports, and first and last month rents are so high and most of our vulnerable constituents can't even afford to move. So we're gonna give you a little background information to go on? Sure. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, Mindy Elliott uh, with Flynn Judici Government Affairs representing the Reno Housing Authority, the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, and the rural, um, Nevada Rural Housing Authority. Um, as this bill, um, I'd like to go ahead and walk through the bill 
for you. The first section of the bill uh, talks about the housing authorities and the housing authority requirements. I want to make sure that ever, um, up, up on Nellis, I have provided uh, a couple of exhibits for you. One is the inspection checklist that the housing authorities um, actually utilize when they're going to into the properties before they're rented. And when a voucher holder um, has a voucher, the housing authorities are, are required, and it's required for them to go in at least at a minimum of two, every two years to actually go through the checklist. So I just want to let everyone know that that, that not sure, um, we've had some great conversations. Uh, Assemblywoman Durand um, and I and the housing authorities, we've been in a lot of discussions to make sure that these inspections are actually taking place. The bill doesn't change the requirement for the inspections, but what the bill does is that it now, we're going to make every effort, we being the housing authorities, are going to make every effort to have the tenant attest that it actually, uh, the inspection actually occurred. So that's a differential. The HUD inspections, and actually the timing's actually really good on this because um, HUD just changed, and I have, I've placed up there, um, they just changed the rules, effective May 10th, 2023. So they have a new process, um, it's called INSPIRE, um, and it, it provides a new approach to defining and assessing housing quality. So as, as these new rules, rules, sorry, rules roll out, um, we will be able to um, utilize uh, this bill to ensure that A, that the, that the housing authorities, from the state's perspective, that the housing authorities are doing their job, but more importantly, that B, that the tenants um, have an opportunity to acknowledge. The, the um, inspection checklist is very robust. I don't know if you've seen it, it's eight pages long. So it is a very robust document that the housing um, authorities utilize. They have contractors that um, they utilize to go out and actually go inside the, um, the units. Part of what I think uh, could be some of the deficiencies that Assemblywoman Duran and some of the constituents um, are seeing, have seen, is the fact that during COVID, uh, of course, there were no inspections that were taking place. So the housing authorities um, are doing somewhat of a catch up um, to make sure that the properties are um, efficient and effective. So that's section one of the bill. Um, section two of the bill, um, the um, Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority in 2017 was placed in, section, in uh, NRS 354 and was identified as a public body. Um, Senator Parks um, submitted the bill back in 2017 he wanted some additional oversight into the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. Um, former Assemblyman McCurdy is the chairman of the, um, of the Housing Authority now. The, the Housing Authority has been, has been reconstituted from the board's perspective. We have elected officials that are sitting on the board now. It's a very robust board. They're very engaged. And the requirement to uh, provide the financial um, statements, so on and so forth, to the Nevada Tax Division. Um, the, 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 uh, the housing authorities are on federal um, fiscal years, and of course the state has a different fiscal year, so there's always, there's an overlap, and it's, it's, it, it's not working for them. But furthermore, it really is redundant. There isn't another housing authority that has this requirement. It was just something that uh, Senator Parks you, everyone that's been here a while might recall in 2017, there might have been a few issues with the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, but those have since um, have gone away. And as I said, they've, the board has completely changed. As, uh, former Assemblyman McCurdy is now the chair. Um, um, I, I, I don't know what else to say other than that back in the day, um, it's all a different ball game now, and there really isn't any reason for them to still have that requirement under 354. They are still a public body. They're still in statute. They're still subject to open meeting laws, and, and no different than any other housing authority. So this, this part of the bill um, just simply removes them from NRS 354. So with that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. And, uh, do you do you mention some other witnesses on Zoom? Do you want me to go to they, them first, or they they're only here? They're my phone a friend. If okay. there are some questions, since I'm 
I know enough to be dangerous. Um, th um, for Mindy Elliott, uh, Flynn Judici, for the record, I know enough to be dangerous. So if we're hoping that um, this bill's pretty clean. That um, if less, I need to phone a friend. Um, they're happy to provide uh, context if I can't. Thank you very much, members. Any questions, uh, Senator Krasner? Thank you for uh, thank you, Chair, and thank Vice Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Just a, a quick question: You said the the law has recently changed in the area. So, uh, is the housing for the low income uh, government assisted? Uh, housing being conducted once a year or once every two years? Um, it's it's uh, two years. Every two years, they are they're required. Um, every two years, yeah. I had that confirmed. So, thank you very much, uh, Senator Daly. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So. I guess I need to ask a few more questions about the local government and the changes that you're making. I don't have a problem with the inspection part. I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, but you said there was a reason that it was put in there, and I was just going back and forth trying to look at 354 and then 315 and the formation. It was uh, um, through you, um, Vice oh, Chair. Please go directly to the member. Thank, Thank you. you so much. The bill number is was Senate Bill 183. No, no, no I didn't need oh, the bill number. Sorry. I was just trying to figure out why we're making those changes and taking it taking it out now. If you could try to so, so the first one, Section Three under 354 or 474, it gives a definition of a local government. Local government includes the rural housing authority. You're keeping that where population is less than 100,000. And then a regional authority formed pursuant to 315-7805, you're taking that out. So when it gets formed under, what is it, 315-7805, that's for the regional one where they're merging two or more together? Yes, sir. So you're not going to do those anymore? I, I, for the Mindy Elliott, um, are we going to are we going to collapse any to so create? Are we going to create a regional any further regional housing authorities? Regional authorities in counties with population is seven hundred thousand or more, which is the three one five seventy eight zero five. The part you're trying to delete. So, what's going to be the governing board of that if you remove that? It's uh, uh, Mindy Elliott. For the record, the governing board is um, is in statute in three one five. He said it is in statute in 315. There's representatives, uh, Mindy Ellett for the record, there's representatives from North Las Vegas, Clark County, Henderson, Las Vegas. They are um, on, they're currently on the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority Board. Am I answering your question? I'm so sorry, Senator, if I'm... Well, I'm just trying to figure out why we're, we're changing that. So I see... 315-7805, and it says who's on the board in a county who's above if you create a regional authority, which you have a regional authority now. So then when you go back to the bill and you're saying a local government means a, uh, a local government includes B, and then the rural housing authority and then two, a regional housing authority form pursuant to 317805. So you're deleting that. Does that mean it's no longer a local government? No, it's because under NRS 315, it's in statute under 315. They placed it under 354, for the record, Mindy Elliott, for the purposes of just for the purposes of providing financial oversight into the Nevada Tax Division. They had to, that's, that's what this section did. You could check with legal. That's my understanding. I have phone a friend if we need one. But my understanding, under 354, they were required to provide, he's, he's texting me. I don't, I don't know if he can. 
And I could see if that other witness is available. Oh, Mahogany on says, uh, Ms. Turfley will respond. Ms. Turfley, thank you for being here, or whoever would like to answer, if you'd please state your name for the record. And you can go straight to Senator Daly. Thank you for joining us today. Sorry, I can't. Uh, there we are. Good uh, afternoon. Mahogany Turfley for Legal Counselor for Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, 2460 Professional Court, Suite 200, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89128. And so what this uh, assembly, proposed assembly bill is doing is just, it's not changing 315 and how the, how that's set up. It's just taking us out of the requirement, financial requirements under 354, which we should have never been a part of. The other two housing authorities were exempted from this. We should have been exempted as well. It was just an improper way to, to try to, improper uh, way to try to try to solve a problem. Um, and have some financial oversight over at Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, but they should have never been part of this uh, 354. Thank you, Mr. Turfley. Senator Daly, any follow-up? Yes, thank you. So what are the other financial requirements that are under 354 because you're defined as a local government? So currently, uh, we are actually monitoring, we see federal funds from HUD. So we're on a federal fiscal policy. And so those re financial requirements are done under the federal policy. And so this is put us under the state policy, which would make an undue burden have to have us have to have our financial department make a whole new financials under the state state um, state policy, fiscal policy in fiscal year. So we're governed by HUD under the financials, and then also by our board of of uh, commissioners, which Ms. Uh, Mendy was was telling you about so we're already governed by uh, HUD under the under the federal guidelines thank you senator Daly. any additional questions or yeah and I, so I'm so I'm not following so you have the individual housing authority and you have more than one in Clark County you have several different ones I'm assuming and each one of those are under 354 right hold on hold on no. so <laughs> So then when there's more than one and you form a regional housing authority, why are they, why is it different than if it would, they were all separate? Because when there's more than one housing authority, if you go back and look at what the regional housing authority is, if there's more than one, then they can merge together, become a regional lower authority, and then the board is, the county commissioners, the city council people, all of that, that's the governing body. So I'm not following, whereas if they were individual, they're not covered by HUD or whatever, or I'm not following. But when they all group together, now they're all of a sudden covered by HUD and they have additional financial obligations. So I'm just not following that. Maybe you'll have to come and talk to me offline. We want to keep this moving. Uh, but it's not making sense to me. Uh, maybe it's just because I don't know enough about how it all works. But when I try to read through what the lit words actually say, it's not adding up. Thank so, you, Senator Daly, and perhaps um, you could follow up offline. I appreciate your trying to walk us through it. Members, any additional? Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm just going to make sure I've got it clear in my mind where we're headed with this. Uh, and again, county's under 100,000. The only other one I is most of my counties are under 100,000 other than Clark. Uh, so. I just as I want to make sure I'm clear on the language. So then the fact that if the local government did in fact loan money to the Nevada Rural Housing, Rural Housing Authority, then they in fact would be responsible for these inspections, the local government. Uh, for the record, Mindy Elliott, the, the housing authorities are responsible to HUD because these are HUD vouchers they are responsible to, to, to conduct the all of the inspections. And, and they're based on HUD guidelines. And they gather the information. And if there are deficiencies, it's based on the HUD guidelines. And it is up to the housing authority, since they are managing the vouchers, to clear up whatever the deficiencies might be if, if there is. It doesn't have. The, the local jurisdictions don't have any input into those inspections. It's all done through the federal government and HUD. Okay, but how about 
how about remediation then of those issues that are discovered? The, the local government is in fact on the hood hook. Okay. Through the um, Mindy Elliott, for the record, Senator Gokachia, there is no responsibility by local governments. All of the responsibility is is borne by the all the housing authorities within the state for any remediation. It's either them if they're managing the the property, or it's the landlord if if they are receiving a voucher from the federal government. Fine. I just want that clarification on the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Members, any additional questions? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much for presenting the bill. And I'd like to now open it up to support of Assembly Bill 333. Anyone who'd like to speak in support uh, here in Carson City or down at the Sawyer Building? Okay. Not seeing anyone uh, coming up. So broadcasting on the phone lines. Anyone in support of Assembly Bill 333? would like to be heard. If you would like to testify in support of AB 333, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please state your name for the record and proceed. My name is Fred here. I'm with the, Southern, the Chief Administrative Officer for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. And I just want to add, I, I think just for some clarification in terms of know why we are uh, why we are considered a part of the the, the uh, regional housing. So it's only one housing authority in Las Vegas. That's the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. We 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 regionalized all three housing authorities back in 2010. Um, you asked the question why? What is the difference? The funding the funding source that um, we received 90 percent of our money from the from the federal government, which is governed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We, the housing authority do not receive any adversarial money at all. Um, the reporting requirements on, uh, consists of about 32 pages worth of financial documents, which only about three pages actually consists of where the housing can respond to. Um, the information that we provide to the state, I've been providing that state every year. Um, but this requirement requires us to change our fiscal year, uh, to change our geo, general ledger of requirements. Um, and we have to get permission from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to change our fiscal year. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know the reason why we were slated to be part of this uh, local government um, in as much as rural and, and Reno weren't, um, but for some reason we were. But in terms of getting any state dollars or adversarial tax dollars, how does the how do, 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 do I receive anything? Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Thank you. Broadcasting, anyone else on the phone lines? If you would like to testify in support of AB 333, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. I'd like to now go to opposition to Assembly Bill 333. Anyone who wants to speak in the oppos opposition side? here in Carson City, down at the Sawyer Building. Don't see anyone coming up. Broadcasting anyone on the phone lines who wants to be heard in opposition to Assembly Bill 333. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 333, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Neutral, anyone who is neutral to Assembly Bill 333 and wants to be heard, either here in Carson City or down at the Sawyer Building. Oh. Yeah. I'm not seeing anyone come up. So in broadcasting, can we go to the phone lines? Neutral on Assembly Bill 333. If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 333, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Okay, and I don't see our bill sponsor anymore, but I don't know if there was any closing remarks. No? All right, and thank you for that. And so with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 333. And next, we will open up the hearing. Well, never mind, I don't see Assemblyman Watts. Is somebody here uh, co-presenting with Assemblyman Watts? That's fine, we can roll that for now, and we can move right into our Treasurer's Bill. Mr. Manage, does that work? Yeah, the treasurer can grab Squire. He's walking downstairs. So is it okay we move forward? Do you want me to roll it? Yeah, no worries. All right, we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 33. 33. <laughs> And Mr. Treasurer, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the Senate Government Affairs Committee. For the record, I am Zach Conine, and I have the pleasure of serving as your state treasurer. It's great to be here this afternoon to present Assembly Bill 33. Also, if anybody from LCB Audio is listening, I'm echoing in the room in a way that will probably bother other people in the building. Uh, sorry about that. The treasurer's primary role is to serve as the state's chief investment officer. Thanks to the tireless efforts of the small but dedicated team in our investments division, the treasurer's office works each day to create more opportunity for our state government. Since the 2019 legislative session, we have worked to modernize and We have worked to, can you still hear me, Chair? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, okay great. Uh, since the 2019 legislative session, we have worked to modernize Nevada's investment statutes to provide the investments division with the tools they need to maximize investment returns for the state, uh, while also ensuring that we have adequate safeguards in place to mitigate uh, potential risk. In short, our first job is not losing money. Our second job is not losing money. Our third job is preserving liquidity, and our fourth job, and it's a deep fourth, is making money on behalf of the state. We're good at all the jobs, uh, but the fourth job, we're very happy, provided $180 million of the $251 million in increased uh, revenue during the last economic forum. Assembly Bill 33 continues on this work by providing the Treasurer's Office with additional flexibility for our investment vehicles, while also providing for parity among portfolio limits for certain type of investments in the general portfolio, the permanent school fund, and the local government investment pool. Section 1 of this bill expands the list of authorized investments for money in the state's permanent school fund, or PSF, to include two additional vehicles. First, it allows monies from the PSF to be invested in commercial paper, which are short-term promissory notes issued by companies, that will mature in 270 days or less and are rated A1, P1, or better, and cannot exceed 10% of the total portfolio for the PSF. Um, you've heard 
double A, triple A. Those are for longer term investments. Shorter term investments use a scale of P1 through P3, with P1 being uh, the best or least likely of default, I suppose. Additionally, AB33 also allows money from the PSF to be invested in notes, bonds, or other unconditional uh, obligations that are issued by certain corporations organized and operating in the United States or depository institutions licensed by the United States. Section 2 of the bill increases from 20 to 25 percent the maximum share of the general portfolio that can be invested in bankers' acceptances, which are short-term issuances from a bank that guarantees payment at a later date. Section 2 also authorizes money from the general portfolio to be invested in commercial paper that is issued by certain trusts or corporations who issue through a limited liability company, or LLC. Section 3 of the bill is seeking to increase parity among the various investment vehicles managed by the Treasury. Section 3 revises the authorized investments for the local government investment pool. As a reminder, the LGIP is a vehicle by which uh, local, state, uh, local municipal governments as well as school districts can invest with the state. Um, to require that investments in negotiable certificates of deposit must mature in under five years from the time of purchase and be rated by a nationally recognized rating service as A1, P1, or better. Section 3 also provides that not more than 5% of the LGIP may be invested in notes, bonds, or other unconditional obligations issued by any one commercial bank, insured credit union, savings and loan association, or savings bank. Additionally, Section 3 increases from 20 to 25 percent the amount that the local government investment pool can invest in bankers' acceptances of the kind and maturities made eligible by law with Federal Reserve banks or trust companies, which are members of the Federal Reserve system. And finally, this bill seeks to expand the role of Nevada's Capital Investment Corporation, which was passed by the legislature in 2011. Broadly, the Nevada Capital Investment Corporation, or NCIC, is the state's direct investment vehicle, allowing for monies from the Permanent School Fund to serve as capital invested directly in Nevada-based businesses engaged in healthcare, cybersecurity, defense, renewable energy, information technology, and other businesses that benefit the state. All of the interest returned from these investments are returned to the State Education Fund, and the investment returns from the NCIC have more than doubled the returns from the Permanent School Fund generally. Section 4 of the bill increases the amount that can be transferred from the, to the NCIC from the Permanent School Fund uh, from $75 million to $125 million, expanding on the work that was done in the 2021 session of the legislature. Section 4 also provides additional flexibility for the NCIC to encourage a greater level of investment in fund managers who have proven track records of investing in small businesses throughout the country. Assembly Bill 33 accomplishes this by reducing the 70% threshold in the NCIC that must go to businesses directly in Nevada to 50%. Section 4 also allows for funds to be invested in pooled funds that will allow us to take advantage of multi-state venture uh, funds that have expressed interest in partnering with the state of Nevada to grow new and existing small businesses over the coming years. Uh, finally, I want to direct, if I could, the committee's attention to a minor proposed amendment from our office, which is posted on Nellis. This amendment changes and to or in Section 3, Subsection 1, Sub G, Sub 2. Overall, the changes in Assembly Bill 33 help to modernize and improve Nevada's investment statutes by giving us new tools and increased flexibility to generate higher investment returns for the state. This concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Happy to answer any questions from the committee. I'm also joined today by our Deputy of Investments, Mr. Stephen Hill. And thank you for that presentation, Mr. Treasurer. With that, members, any questions? We'll start off with Assemblyman, excuse me, <laughs> Senator Daly. That's okay, Mr. Chair. I, I, I've slipped and called you madam and a couple other things, so I'm sorry. My, my, my apologies. So uh, thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Um, so I got a couple of questions. So in the new, in Section 1, I believe it is, you're adding in a, a, a new investment um, category uh, for O and P. So... How come we didn't have that as an investment category before? What, what is commercial paper? Has that got to do with your uh, corporations or limited liability corporations that you're trying to add in in another section? I'll have a separate question for that. And then, of course, of course, what are unconditional obligations? Obviously, they weren't in there before. I'm sure they're not brand new. Um, so why, why didn't we have them before? What are the risks associated uh, with those types of investments, and uh, what are we trying to accomplish by adding this in? Uh, other than I know you want to 
diversify and hopefully have a greater return, but there's also a greater risk. So. Uh, Treasurer Conine, for the record, so this uh, seeks to clear up some holes in our investment uh, opportunities to, to speak to, from a risk perspective, this matches the risk kind of throughout the portfolio, right? These are high credit rated entities um, who have no more risk than anything else we can currently bind. Uh, unconditional obligations broadly mean that the obligation is not conditioned on something else. In other words, they owe that money and there are no ways out of them holding that, owing that money, as opposed to, say, a conditional obligation, which could be they owe that money if a certain thing happens, right? So these are uh, unconditional is less risky than conditional because there are no uh, conditions. But I'll, I'll turn it over to our Deputy of Investments, um, Mr. Stephen Hale, if he wants to provide any more information there. Thank you. Stephen Hale, Deputy Treasurer um, Investments. The, the, I believe the, the LLC component of this just basically speaks to um, the fact that a lot of companies now issue or create subsidiaries that are LLCs, not corporations. I believe when this was originally done, not too many companies had LLCs as subsidiaries issuing commercial paper. So the, the, the substance and tenor of commercial paper hasn't changed in this at all. It's just that some of these, um, IBM, for example, can now issue commercial paper out of an LLC as opposed to a, a corporate subsidiary. Please follow up. And, and thank you. All right, so <clears throat> I was just wanting to find out uh, what those investments entailed and various things. So that was on my next question, which was uh, Section 2. It's on page 7 and on page 14 where you reference the trust or limited liability company. But I think you answered that with, the, with what you uh, just mentioned. So then in Section 3, sub G, I think it's on page 12. Let me get to it. So help explain to me what we're, what we're trying to get done from there so we can make investments that are outside the insurance limits in that. Uh, in, is it less restrictive, more restrictive uh, on the, infra or the uh, negotiable certificates of deposits issued by new people? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record. So the goal here is to uh, create parity amongst other investments that can be made in LGIP. So we have the ability to purchase uh, paper like this in the direct portfolio, uh, but we're not currently able, just because that language wasn't there, um, to purchase it for local governments. And so it doesn't um, extend or change the risk universe. It just creates that parity um, that we're going for in order to speed up the process. Uh, next question was. Can I um, can I add something here? So the, one other component of this. I'm um, sorry, Stephen Hale, for the record. Uh, one other component of this is we just changed a word in this again for um, some for parity, but we changed uh, and to or because it wasn't necessary. For, it's not necessary for um, the treasurer's group or the counties to use both manners of um, sort of the strict support for our investments. We can either have an A1 pay one, A1 P1 um, condition or collateralize, which are, we do with banks and, and other um, agencies. Please follow. It, my uh, my uh, quote, I think, right? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the next question was on uh, section three, sub L, page 13 into 14 on eliminating the uh, the interest on the obligation exempt from federal income tax. I thought most municipal bonds and bonds that were uh, issued by cities, counties, and various things, the advantage to that is, is that any interest that a person earns purchasing them is that they wouldn't have to pay uh, tax on that. So are we changing that with the eliminating that? or? Uh, is it going to make bonds less attractive that municipalities would sell um, if they're not tax-exempt? 
Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, uh, the intention here is to be able to purchase obligations from state and local governments that aren't necessarily tax exempt. Um, the state of Nevada, for instance, uh, last year issued a taxable bond uh, because the proceeds for that bond were needed to be used uh, more flexibly. And so we're seeing uh, municipalities, states, uh, local governments issue bonds that, that we may want to purchase as a state. Um, by definition, when we're doing the analysis on uh, what we should or shouldn't buy, if a bond is taxable, it has a different set of uh, math, right? We know that that bond is going to pay differently than a bond that isn't taxable. This gives us the flexibility to do both. But the taxability of a bond um, has nothing to do with the risk associated with it, simply the return side. Understood. Thank you. And I'm just trying to get clarification on that so we're not changing the fact that we're going to be able to issue tax-exempt bonds. We would be able to potentially purchase uh, local government bonds that weren't tax-exempt uh, before it was limited to only tax-exempt. Okay. And then uh, my last question in Section 4, and this is the one where we probably may end up disagreeing, is I'm not a fan of private equity. I know you guys are wanting to... We're already invested in it. You want to increase that amount by $50 million. Um, I just, I would have concerns with that. I'm not sure you'll convince me, but uh, uh, I know in the investments and stuff that we do, like for uh, our pension plan and various things, we haven't gone to a lot of these alternative investments, including private equity. It just uh, has an increased risk, and I have never looked upon them fondly. Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, I, I think um, the best way I can possibly describe this is that not all private equity, uh, just like not all pensions, just like not all um, pieces of, of commercial paper are com created equally. Our, our goal here is to use part of the permanent school fund to generate additional returns. Uh, and we have historically, right, basically doubling the returns in this. But we're doing that by focusing on private equity companies that are dealing with mid to late stage companies um, that are uh, that have fee structures that are very, very low, right? I think we're all kind of familiar with the, the private equity companies who are high fee, uh, high return, high risk. Uh, and that is deeply not our work. Um, so while I, I certainly uh, would agree with you that there is some good private equity and some bad private equity. Um, I, I think you know which side we try to be on. Treasurer Conant, for the record, if I didn't say it. Thank you. Senator, follow up? No. Uh, members, any additional questions? Senator Guaycachia, please. No? Oh. And, and I. And I apologize. I don't know if I heard um, if I heard you you explain this, and, and if I'm making you repeat yourself, I apologize for doing that. But can you explain the 75 to 125? Just the number. How? What? What is it that triggered us realizing? Wait a minute. We need a little bit more of a cushion. Here's why. Here's how, here's what we have in in the immediate pipeline. If you could just walk us through that. Treasurer Conan, for the record. So that statutory carve-off is a, is a maximum amount, right? So right now the maximum amount is $75 million. We're looking to increase that maximum amount to $125 million. When dollars are not invested directly through the Nevada Capital Investment Corporation, they remain invested in the rest of the corpus of the permanent school fund. In other words, so there's no opportunity cost loss there, right? If there's a dollar that is in... Uh, the Nevada Capital Investment Corporation that hasn't yet been deployed, it is still being invested on the permanent school fund side. So I think that's important, right? We don't have to make a choice here. It all remains as part of the permanent school fund. Um, from a Nevada Capital Investment Corporation, you know, we have been spending the last two years or so redeveloping that, uh, that investment vehicle, bringing on a new board uh, with experts like Robert Goldberg uh, from Northern Nevada, uh, making sure that we've got uh, people like Jan Jones who are, you know, see a ton of deal flow in Southern Nevada and are seeing the work that comes out of you and 
UNLV and Blackfire uh, and other institutions down the south. And our goal here is to make sure that we have the dry powder necessary to take advantage of these investment opportunities when they come up. And so we believe that uh, 125 million is kind of the right target uh, to hit potential opportunities in the pipeline. Now, let's be clear, uh, investments like that take a lot of time and a lot of diligence, uh, and we don't expect we would be deploying this capital uh, every day. But with these changes and um, the regulatory and other work that we've done, we think it's going to give us an opportunity to continue getting outsized returns for the permanent school fund, while at the same time supporting Nevada businesses uh, or businesses that might want to move to Nevada. Right. So those two things in parallel are the work uh, of the Nevada Capital Investment Corporation. Understood. Members, any questions? Uh, Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Treasurer. I appreciate the time you took going over the bill with me. And it's a question I didn't think of when we met. On page 13 of the original bill, the new language down at line 42, the change of uh, purchases of bankers, acceptances may not exceed 20, changing it to 25%. Can you explain what that's going to accomplish and why, why we're changing that? Or 20 25%? And if not, I can catch up with you online. I apologize. I did not think of that when we met. No, that, that's quite all right. And I, I will do a bad job of um, describing what bankers' acceptances are. But they're basically short-term uh, promissory notes from banks. And so that allows us uh, to have 25% uh, of the portfolio um, this is the local government portfolio invested in those. The, the term to majority is 180 days, right? So a relatively short period of time. And again, we're trying to get to parity here between different portfolios. So we want to make sure that, that LGIP investments and the rest of the portfolio can be done in the same way. These are very, very low risk, temporary exchanges, temporary purchases. Um, well, they're not bonds, right? Because of the time frame, but, um, do you, anything you'd want to add there, Deputy? Um, they are very short. They're, they're, they are very low risk. I'm oh, sorry, Stephen Hale, for the record. Um, they're very short, very, very low risk, the way they're structured. But to be honest, right as of right now, and since I've been here, we don't purchase many of these at all. It's just, a, it's just someday we may need the flexibility to purchase them, but it's not a big, it's not a big um, pot or pool for us. Treasure Conan, for the record. And that, that does speak to some of the flexibility within the investment um, statutes, right? Given the nature of our legislative process, we think it's important to have um, flexibility in different pools because we never know what pool we're going to have to go to because we don't know what's going to happen, right? For instance, I know this won't surprise everybody, um, if there is a default at the federal level uh, in the next couple of weeks, that will vastly change the sorts of things that we would invest in in uh, the state and is frankly changing what we invest invest in on the, the lead up to it. So all of these give us the flexibility to go where the ball is um, if and when we need to. Thank you, Treasurer Kona, and thank you, Deputy Treasurer Hill. Thanks, Chair. Please, Senator Krasner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Treasurer Conine. So I just had a question in Section 4, Sub 2 of the bill, uh, which reads, it's changing the language. It was previously ensure that at least 70, and it changes it to more than 50% of all private equity funding provided by the corporation for public benefit. And here's the change language, including without limitation private equity funding provided by, by a corporation for public benefit to a pooled fund that includes businesses located outside of the state. So that is new language that, uh, businesses located outside of the state. Previously, the language just provided for businesses located in the state or seeking to locate to this state. And so I'm, I'm wondering two things. One, why you are choosing to change that language so it includes businesses that are located outside of the state of Nevada. And then two, is it possible that all of that more than 50% of private equity funding could go to businesses located outside of the state of Nevada. Thank you. Uh, 
Treasurer Conan, for the record. So our intention here and, and in this, the Corporation for Public Benefit is, in fact, the Nevada Capital Investment Corporation. That's the, the legal structure. So that's what we're referring to there. Um, but the goal here is that we find ourselves in a bit of a chicken and egg universe when it comes to these sorts of direct investments. There are investors uh, that may be legally based in other states or funds based in other states making investments into Nevada. But under the current um, structure, we cannot invest in them because of where the the investment company is corpused as opposed to where their investments are corpused. And so the, the goal here is to add that in, but also to make sure that if there is a pooled fund, uh, so for instance, they have, say, 10 companies that they invest in, and some of those companies are located in Nevada and some of those companies aren't, that we aren't uh, forbidden to invest in them. Uh, again, the, the goal here is to really provide as much flexibility as we can so that we can both incent businesses to come to Nevada, uh, but also incent vis businesses to expand to Nevada. Right? Maybe they don't move their corporate headquarters, but they open up a facility uh, within our state's borders and create the associated taxes um, with that. And so we want to just, again, create a little bit more flexibility so we aren't just investing in businesses after they've moved, um, but instead could invest in businesses that are for. And this is language that we have worked on for uh, quite some time with um, with companies that are doing this investment work with GoEd um, and with LVGA and others trying to get to language that sort of solves this chicken and egg problem. Um, but open any and all feedback, certainly, because we're trying to think. Thank you. And just one um, quick follow-up question. So these uh, corporations, businesses that are located outside of the state of Nevada, must they be located in another state within the United States, or could they be a foreign uh, business located outside of the United States? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, um, my understanding under the, the regulations is that these are businesses located within, um, within the United States, but we can certainly follow up, and I will confirm that for you. I can tell you from a, a, just from an investment philosophy perspective and from a regulation perspective, we would not make a direct investment in a company that wasn't subject to the laws and the responsibilities of the United States, just from a risk perspective. Um, I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. It just doesn't yeah. say that in the language. That's why I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Seeing none. Treasurer, again, thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to invite you to sit back, and at this time we'll invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 33 to please come forward either in Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone support of, for Assembly Bill 33? If you would like to testify in support of AB 33, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Uh, next we'll take uh, testimony in opposition for Assembly Bill 33, please. And BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone in opposition for Assembly Bill 33? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 33, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. In the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. We, we temporarily lost the feed to Las Vegas, but if there's somebody there wishing to testify in opposition, just please hit the speak mic. I, I can't see if somebody's sitting at the table or not. There we go. Never mind. Nobody's there. BPS, uh, anybody wishing to, to testify in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 33? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 33, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. 
Anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position, Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, Mr. Treasurer, any closing remarks you may have? Uh, just very briefly, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you to the hardest working committee uh, in the Senate for taking a few moments out of your day to hear the bill. And uh, if you find yourself after a legislative session looking for something to do in Carson City, uh, as always, uh, anyone is welcome to join us at 515 uh, every morning while we try to make sure that the state's dollars can become just a little bit bigger each and every day. Uh, Treasurer Conine, once again, for the record, thanks for having us. Mr. Treasurer, I do appreciate the amount of enthusiasm your bill produced. I, don't th I think it's the first time we don't have a single person testify. Uh, thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 33. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. And with that, uh, we do have Speaker Yeager. Uh, and so we will take Assembly Bill 378 next. We will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 378 whenever you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Flores, members uh, of the committee. My name is Steve Yeager. I represent Assembly District 9. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to present Assembly Bill 378 in its first reprint, which deals with state collective bargaining. Uh, I do believe I have, uh, hopefully I have Mr. Carter Bundy on Zoom to help um, answer questions uh, if some arise. And if not, I have some backup behind me. And so anyway, uh, I'm going to keep this really brief. Uh, this bill deals with state collective bargaining, and the question for this committee is not whether you agree with collective bargaining at the state level, because of course that's already law. That was passed by the legislature in the 2019 session. But what this bill seeks to do is to make the process better. Um, we ran into some problems, and some of you may be aware of this, uh, but we ran into some problems in the last round of negotiations, not the ones that are happening now, but the ones that were happening in 2021 with a couple of bargaining units and the executive. And the problem was this. They weren't able to get their negotiations fully resolved until after the close of the legislative session. Uh, that's not very helpful for us as a legislature because we, of course, can't fund uh, arbitration agreements and arbitration awards outside of a legislative session. Uh, we do have the Interim Finance Committee, but constitutionally, the Interim Finance Committee cannot provide pay raises. That can only be done by the entire legislature. And part of the reason that this issue arose was the arbitration process. In this particular instance back in, um, I guess it would have been the, t the end of the 2020 into the 2021 session, the parties were not able to agree and they had to go to arbitration. It took a long time to select an arbitrator and to get through that process. Ultimately, the bargaining units were victorious, but that decision came after the legislative session. And so as a result of that, there, is, there are some bills working through this session to try to make good on those awards. But I think from a state philosophy, uh, you, bargaining units have the ability to collectively bargain, and if they are successful, in arbitrations or otherwise, we ought to fund those. So the bill that you have in front of you takes the current timeline and tries to find the pressure points and make them better. Um, I Hopefully you have this timeline up on Nellis. Um, I'm not gonna say it's the easiest thing to read, but I think what you're gonna see is a couple different things. It, it reviews the timeline as it exists now in, in law versus what is proposed in the first reprint of Assembly Bill 378. And if you start at the beginning of that timeline, probably the most important thing is what we're going to try to do is pre-select a mediator and an arbitrator. So before you even start negotiating, you have those people locked on because that's what takes the most amount of time, the parties going back and forth, trying to pick an arbitrator, trying to find a date to actually have arbitration. So you see, I think that's really the signature part of this bill is trying to do that at the beginning so that if you need those people, they are in place and you can go right to mediation and then to arbitration. You'll also see that uh, the, the date to begin negotiations has moved up a month. Uh, feedback that I've got is always good to have more time to negotiate rather than less time. And then I think you'll see at the end of the timeline, the way we envision this, we're going to compress the time between mediation and arbitration. And ultimately, our goal with this bill is that any arbitration decision would be made by March 5th, which if you think about we're in the midst of a legislative session now, and we're about two months beyond 
um, March 5th. So that would give the legislature time to be able to actually fund any sort of decision or in the case they can't reach an agreement, be able to actually fund the arbitration award. Um, so the bill you know, makes a lot of sort of technical changes in that way, but that's really what we're trying to achieve is to say if we're gonna have this process, let's have a process that actually makes sense and that works with uh, Nevada's biennial legislative session. And if, with uh, your permission, Chair, um, knowing how much work this committee has to do and knowing I have another bill waiting after me, uh, I would close there and be happy to answer any questions and hopefully have some backup if I can't answer them. And uh, Speaker Yeager, I will say, I don't think um, your backup is on there yet, but, but we, got, we got some very talented folk in the room. Everybody collectively will come up. We'll make it work. <laughs> Uh, with that, members, any questions? I think we're good, Speaker. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 378 to please come forward. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hey there, Brady Easterling for the record. Uh, AFSCME is in support of the bill. Thank you very much. And we did receive your letter as well, and thank you for providing that to the committee. Good afternoon, welcome. Kent Irvin, Nevada Faculty Alliance. I'd just like to offer my support. In researching our bill on collective bargaining, we had to look at a lot of different aspects of these things, and this is just trying to get the best process for for the state classified. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 378? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone in support? If you would like to testify in support of AB 378, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller, you're live. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Carter Bundy with Ask Me. My apologies, Speaker Yeager, um, but Speaker Yeager uh, did this as perfectly, presented as perfectly as possible. Um, this really is just about having a timeline that makes sense and that gives the legislature time to react however it wants to whatever the final result is. Um, uh, I, I actually just got a call while I was testifying uh, <laughs> that was probably for the Zoom. But uh, I apologize for that, uh, Speaker. Terrific job. And I hope that the committee will be willing to support the bill. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support of Assembly Bill 378. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. BPS, we'll stay on the phone. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 378? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 378, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, anybody wishing to testify in opposition, Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, we will then go to the neutral position. BPS, anybody wishing to join us in the neutral position? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 378, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. And we'll go to Las Vegas. Thank you. Chair Flores and members of the Senate Committee on Government Affairs. My name is Bruce Snyder. I am the commissioner of the Employee Management Relations Board, which regulates labor relations between Nevada's governments. 
and the unions that represent their employees. I offer a few comments in the neutral position. Back in 2019, I was asked to provide technical support to the governor's office on SB 135, which provided for collective bargaining for state employees to help ensure the bill would be effective. The original draft of SB 135 made December 1st as the start of negotiations to coincide with the economic forum meeting. However, many believe this would be too tight of a deadline and thus the amendment to the bill moved it to November 1st. I note that the current bill again moves the start date to, to October 1st and I would think that anything that adds a little additional time to the process would be a good thing. More importantly, Section 12B requires the parties to select the mediator and arbitrator and reserve dates at the beginning of the bargaining process. Uh, past experience has shown that waiting for the parties to reach impasse and then select a mediator and arbitrator and reserve dates would not allow the parties to complete the process before the legislature adjourns. Most mediators and arbitrators have booked for several months into the future. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And I don't think we have any questions for you. Anybody else wishing to join us in the neutral position? Seeing none, Speaker Yeager, any closing remarks? Sounds good. And with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 378. And next, we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 262. Senator Watts, whenever you're ready. Excuse me, Assemblyman Watts. I'm, a, I'm changing everyone's title. I will say that in, in Senate education, if anybody followed that hearing, uh, Senator Hammond chaired it today. So there you go. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Howard Watts uh, representing Assembly District 15. And people are getting promotions or demotions all over the place today. So uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, Assembly Bill 262 for your consideration today. Uh, I'll try and keep this brief. Essentially, uh, what this bill seeks to do is set uh, some clear goals for the state to reduce the tailpipe emissions of of our vehicle uh, fleet. There are many benefits uh, to, to moving this forward. Uh, in fact, if you look in section 2.5 of the bill, there are uh, some, some points that discuss the, the value of doing this. You know, uh, air quality, both in the Las Vegas and Reno metropolitan areas, have consistently been ranked uh, poorly among urban areas across the country, um, both for smog and for particulate matter pollution. Um, both of those uh, are, are types of pollution that come out of vehicles. Uh, vehicles are, are one of the main sources, not only of that unhealthy air pollution, but also of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, within our state. Uh, but we do have the opportunity with the uh, growth in zero emissions vehicles, both uh, uh, battery electric as well as um, hydrogen fuel cells. And, and this bill is technology neutral as long as there's no pollution coming out of the vehicle. Uh, obviously, we have the ability to uh, lead in, in helping produce and power those vehicles uh, here in the state. And so I think there's also an, an economic development uh, opportunity with this. Uh, and uh, again, these vehicles are now cost effective, but one of the issues that, that I think, particularly anyone who's been involved in, in some of our uh, budget processes can, can understand is that you know, often we are looking at how to get the biggest bang for our buck within a two-year budget cycle. Um, and even our, our agencies, when they're looking at trying to get vehicles, are trying to look at what is the, the best deal that they can get up front that meets their needs. And in general, that makes a lot of sense. But what we've seen with some of these newer technologies is they might have a slightly higher uh, sticker price kind of up front, but uh, the savings on fuel, the savings on maintenance um, are significant, sometimes 50% or more compared to uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. And so not only do we have uh, environmental and public health Alexa. benefits. Alexa. Alexa. And, and BPS, I think uh, you are unmuted and we can hear you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, not only do we have these uh, environmental and public health benefits, 
and the economic development benefits, um, but we actually have uh, the benefit of cost savings to the taxpayers uh, if we uh, if we uh, do the analysis right. And so that speaks to kind of why I feel this is important, why the bill is brought forward it, it is actually spoken to in section 2.5 of the bill. Section one of the bill essentially tasks uh, our state agencies to when it's practical, again, that has to, the fuel has to be available, all the logistics have to be in place, that we give preference to purchasing automobiles which minimize emissions from that vehicle and um, which minimize the total cost of the vehicle over its service life. And that can include things like fuel costs, maintenance costs. It can also include financial incentives. Um, there are various programs, some operated by uh, uh, utilities. There are tax incentive programs now. Uh, and in fact, with some of the latest federal legislation that was passed, those are now available to local governments as well where they weren't before. So this is uh, additional kind of uh, uh, money that can be used to not only reduce those upfront purchase costs, but make uh, the uh, costs over the lifetime of the vehicle much much more uh, attractive. And we are, uh, for many, many vehicles in our fleet, uh, have a standard service life of 10 years or 100,000 miles. So uh, again, that's a, that's a time frame that we can plan around. All, all that we're asking is that we do that analysis, look over the time that we're expected to have the vehicle, and compare those fuel maintenance and other costs and see what's the best deal for our state. And, uh, and to the extent that uh, vehicles with uh, uh, zero emissions make sense and it's logistical for us to get the, the fueling and infrastructure to, to utilize them, uh, that we make those choices. And then in addition, there's uh, uh, in, uh, particularly in subsection 4B, um, as we're kind of uh, looking at making these choices, uh, looking to use uh, less emissions intensive fuels, so looking to use biofuels when possible. Um, there are actually now, um, there's not very, really a, a much of a cost barrier to make sure that when we're getting uh, any larger heavier duty vehicles in our fleet that use diesel, that they're capable of using a 20% biodiesel blend. That doesn't really come at a cost, but it makes sure that if, uh, that, if that fuel is available that we can try and use that as well. So, uh, and then finally, subsection five uh, and subsection uh, subsection five, and then section two relate to some reporting, so that we can just understand what's going on, what the what the vehicle makeup of our state fleet is, and that way we can see uh, how that may be uh, changing uh, as time goes by. So, uh, again, essentially, the the goals of the bill are to uh, for our vehicles that uh, are using internal combustion engines to try and use um, uh, fuels that uh, are a little bit uh, better for uh, environment and public health. Um, at the same time, when we're looking at acquiring new vehicles, uh, to look at those um, over the entire lifetime of the vehicle to see where we can get, uh, again, not only the, those uh, pollution reduction benefits, but also where we can uh, maximize the return uh, for taxpayers, not just for a biennium, but over the entire service life of that vehicle. So that concludes my presentation. I'm glad to answer any questions that the committee may have. And with that, members will open it for questions. We'll start off with Senator Guicucci, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, and I agree, there's a place we need to look at this. My only concern is uh, the language about biodiesel. It doesn't work in the north in the wintertime. And I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that if we start pushing biodiesel into, say, some of the NDOT yards across the north where people typically come in and fuel. Uh, you know, yeah, there's a cost savings. It's great for the environment, but it's not so good when it gets 40 below. Thank you for that, uh, Senator Guaycachia. Howard Watts, for the record. I appreciate that. So two things. I mean. One is, I think, uh, in our uh, budget subcommittee, we heard about the ongoing upgrades to the Southern Nevada yard, and one of those is actually bringing in, I think, 
E15 for, uh, for vehicles down south. The one thing I'll point to is uh, that I really want to uh, express and, and glad to talk with you uh, in addition if you feel that there's additional clarity needed, but um, this language to the extent practicable, um, I put in here and the intent behind that is really, again, to make sure that it makes sense. So um, if there are any uh, logistical concerns, right, looking at um, other vehicles, if there's issues with fuel availability, if there's issues with range, et cetera, that it would affect the ability to use that vehicle to carry out its purpose, or uh, in your case, if there would be um, weather or other constraints that could um, have a negative impact, then for that particular vehicle, say, okay, that doesn't make sense. We're going we're gonna to do what makes the most sense. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Daly, please. Th th thank you, Mr. Chair. And this just may be a question because I don't know if the answer. Uh, where they're supposed to record the, the type of fuel and various things. Um, so we're all familiar. You go to the gas pump, get a receipt, tells you how many gallons you got. Did the, is there a similar deal when you plug in if you had an electric uh, car and is there a meter that runs and they tell you, I, I don't I don't know I've never never plugged in and and I don't know how the how they would record that I'm I'm certain they can but I was just curious how it works and then do they have different rates like uh, gas is higher in Tonopah than it is in Carson City but <laughs> thank you Senator Daly Howard Watts for the record oh I could spend a long time. Uh, answering that question. And, and uh, one thing I'll note, so specific to the bill, we're just trying to figure out the make, the fuel type makeup of the vehicle. So is this, is this gas? Is this electric? Um, is it, is it something that's using, um, you know, uh, a higher ethanol uh, blend or a higher, higher biodiesel blend? Um, uh, yeah, so it's the type of fuel used. And so, yeah, um, when it comes, so for electric, for example, we wouldn't necessarily need to say this is how much electricity it's using, just to note that it's an electric vehicle, or if it's a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, that that's, that, that that's the fuel that it uses. To your, to your point about uh, uh, tracking electricity and the rates, yes, it varies depending on uh, if that is something that um, most likely for state fleet vehicles, we'd be building charging infrastructure um, and that would, it would basically be coming through our, uh, our electric service. That's very different than the rate structure if you go to a public charging station that, um, that will charge usually on a per kilowatt um, uh, amount. But you can definitely track the amount of, of uh, uh, electricity that is used as a, as a type of fuel. Follow up, please. And I just asked, I mean, simply collecting what type of, of fuel it used isn't really going to get you to the analysis. At some point, you're going to have to start recording a, a cost variation or a cost savings uh, to, to look at uh, some of those things. And then I'll just tease you right now before you answer that question when he said about uh, zero emissions and then he qualified labor about, uh, qualified labor about tailpipe emissions. <laughs> yes, that is correct, tailpipe emissions. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Senator Krasner, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation, Assemblyman Watts. So I just have a quick question. Um, while most of the beginning of the bill in Section 1 uh, is permissive language uh, to the extent practicable, in Section 2.5, the new language actually says it is the policy of this state to pursue and support a transition of all publicly owned light duty vehicles to vehicles which emit zero tailpipe emissions by the year 2040 and to transition all publicly owned medium and heavy duty vehicles to vehicles which emit zero tailpipe emissions by the year 2050. That is new language, correct? Howard Watts for the record. Uh, that is correct. It is legislative declaration, so there is, uh, it, it's setting a, again, a general public policy goal, a direction that we'd like to try and achieve. There are, uh, there are not um, penalties for failing to meet that. Um, essentially what it's saying is um, that we want to meet that, and again, with 
particularly with so with lighter duty vehicles, um, you know, uh, everything from sedans all the way up to pickup trucks um, that we use in our fleet, we're seeing uh, a lot of vehicles coming onto the market already that can meet many of those use cases today, even more on the way right now. And so if you think about a 10 year service life for a vehicle, uh, you know, that would give uh, that would essentially say, hey, if we get to about the year 2030, um, hopefully we'll be in the position where we're we're rolling over our fleet at that point to zero tailpipe emissions vehicles. And then uh, those larger, heavier duty vehicles um, are, are a little bit uh, a little bit further behind in deployment. And so the hope is that we can get to 100 percent by 2050. Quick follow up. So um, then in in section 2.5 uh, sub 2, you're saying that what you want that final paragraph for there to mean is it is the policy goal of this state to pursue and support a transition of all publicly owned light duty vehicles to vehicles which emit zero tailpipe emissions by the year 2040. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is that correct. Because that word goal is not there, but that's your intent. Yes, and that's what was intended with pursue and support, but if, if adding clear language that it's the goal uh, would provide some, uh, some ease with the rest of that language, I'd be glad to, to entertain that. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you. I'll invite you to sit back. And I'll invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 262 to please come forward. Carson City or Las Vegas. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera-Georgeson, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Nevada Conservation League. We're here in support of AB 262. This bill will encourage state agencies to add more electric and hybrid vehicles to their fleets, which will reduce emissions and toxic pollution, all while improving public health and saving the state money. Gas-powered vehicles produce many pollutants that are damaging to our health and are linked to many respiratory illnesses, such as asthma. Additionally, transportation continues to be the top contributor of car carbon pollution in our state. Electric vehicles also cost less to operate and maintain than combustion engines, as EVs have no regular maintenance, ex ma regular maintenance expenses for oil change or smog checks. This makes the total cost of owning an EV significantly cheaper. Getting more EVs in our state fleets is good for public health, good for the planet, and good for Nevada's wallet. We urge the committee support. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, please. Elise Monroy Marsala for the Nevada Public Health Association. A strong ditto to my colleague. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Chair, members of the committee for the record, Jessica Ferrado here today on behalf of Advanced Energy United, a clean energy business association working to make the energy we use clean, affordable, and reliable. We represent over 100 companies across the clean energy spectrum, including electric vehicle manufacturers, fleet operators, and charging infrastructure providers. I'm here to express support for AB 262. Total cost of ownership analysis is the most fiscally responsible approach to state vehicle procurement and would be an excellent move to allow the state to make sound long-term investments that benefit the state well into the future. This approach will ensure that Nevada procurement vehicles are the most affordable over their lifetime, which can result in significant savings for the state, for taxpayers, and free upfront money for other state pr priorities. Electric vehicles can offer considerate savings over, the, over their lifespan. Their fueling costs are just a fraction of equivalent gas-powered vehicles, and maintenance costs are three times lower. If their procurement would save time, the state money over the course of their operating lifetime, those financial benefits could be evaluated accordingly. Thank you to the bill sponsor for bringing this forward, and thank you for the committee to, for their consideration. And thank you for joining us. Whoever wishes to go next. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, Andrew McCain, the Executive Director of the Nevada Franchised Auto Dealers Association. Uh, from a policy standpoint, anything uh, that, number one, let me digress. Everybody wants clean air, everybody wants clean water. And if there's uh, policies and programs in which the state can do that to advance that goal, obviously we support that. Further, when you look in terms of the analysis of, from a fiscal standpoint for the state, what we like about this bill is that it is all-encompassing. It's just not focused on electric. 
it's everything from diesel, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, uh, the development of e-fuels uh, that are coming down the pike that are advancing um, at rapid, rapid pace. We just think this is smart policy, quite honestly. And just to give the, the committee an idea, uh, through Q1 of this year, just to give you, an, uh, you know, a, a perception that the state is moving this way already. Um, electric vehicle uh, registrations for Q1 were 12.3%. Hybrids were 6.9 and plug-in uh, hybrid electrics were 1.9. So that's 21.1% uh, of the state fleet uh, that was registered, new vehicles that is, in Q1 of this year, over a fifth of them are already alternative uh, fuel vehicles. Our manufacturer partners are, are putting new product, uh, literally slightly hyperbolic, but daily, and advancing this technology for range um, and, and Franco reliability, and as, as uh, this you know, Senator from uh, Eureka pointed out, um, yeah, biodiesel in, in Eureka in the middle of the winter, it's uh, a little gelatinized, but they're working on being able to perfect that and improve it. And um, you know, whereas right now an EV in in, in Elko County, quite honestly, is is probably not a pretty good proposition for several different reasons. Uh, the hybrid products that are that are out and coming can certainly bridge that gap and then meet the state's goal to reduce carbon emissions. So, Mr. Chair, I think I've spoken enough. You guys have had a late day, so thanks for your time. And thank you for joining us. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paige Barnes with the Ferrado Company here today on behalf of Ceres. Ceres is a nonprofit sustainability organization with the country's most influential companies and investors to build a more sustainable global economy. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of AB 262. A 2020 consumer report analysis demonstrates EV owners save between six and 10,000 over the vehicle's lifetime, given the significant fuel and maintenance cost savings. Consumer savings are even greater when you include EV incentives recently passed by Congress. These operational cost savings are further amplified for fleet operators, which typically use vehicles more frequently than individually owned vehicles. Increasingly, major global and U.S. companies are committing to transitioning vehicles in their corporate fleets to zero emission models. We have found within our Corporate Electric Vehicle Alliance a collaboration of 30 companies, including Amazon, DHL, JLL, IKEA, and others. Uh, they plan to purchase 330,000 electric vehicles in the next five years alone. As public fleets retire old gasoline and diesel vehicles just like these companies, states and local governments can have can save significant amounts of money for taxpayers by transitioning to electric fleets. Beyond generating significant operational savings for public fleets, AB 262 will drive further investments in the state's growing EV supply chain and manufacturing capabilities. By ex no. EV adoption can further benefit Nevada technology when it's integrated with the electricity sector. AB 262 helps to build a strong foundation for Nevada's ability to stay competitive by investing in common sense, clean transportation solutions while generating significant savings, clean air, and public health benefits for the state. And we respectfully urge your support for this bill. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Seeing no one else in support, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone in support for Assembly Bill 262? If you would like to testify in support of AB 262, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. Barry Cole, B-A-R-Y, C-O-L-E. I'm a member of Nevada Clinicians for Climate Action. I am in support of AB 262, anything to reduce emissions will improve air quality. From the standpoint of perception, I would note that leaders lead. If we want more people to move to alternative fuels and to electric vehicles, it would be very good for the state of Nevada to show us the example. I think this is an important piece of legislation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next person in support, over the phone, please. Hello, Chair Flores and members of the committee. My name is Jamarion Williams, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Western Resource Advocates. I am here to support AB 262. 
Uh, the total cost of ownership shows that electric vehicles are cheaper than internal combustion engines due to their decreased fuel and maintenance costs over a vehicle's lifespan. Electric vehicles are estimated to save consumers about 60% on fuel costs compared with the average vehicles in their class. Despite often having a higher upfront purchase cost, owners of electric vehicles see a lifetime total cost of ownership savings of $6,000 to $10,000. These savings are expected to increase as the price of these vehicles drops and reach parity with internal combustion engines, vehicle engines, fuel vehicles, let's just say that. Uh, AB 262 will position Nevada to take advantage of these statements. Nevada will also see public health benefits from zero emission vehicles, which is important given Nevada's air quality challenges. Nevada has the opportunity to reduce emissions of harmful air pollutants, which will help Nevada and save money. The American Lung Association gave Nevada two most populous counties, Clark County and Washoe County, spelling grades for air quality in 2022. One of their recommendations to address this issue is the transition uh, for government fleets to zero mesh vehicles. Uh, so with that said, um, I want to thank uh, the bill sponsor for bringing this bill forward, and uh, we're in full support. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Will Dreyer, and I'm a policy manager with the Electrification Coalition, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that's dedicated to accelerating the adoption of electric vehicles in order to combat the national security risks associated with our reliance on oil and our global economic competitiveness uh, of the future of the automotive industry. I'm calling in to ask you to support AB 262, which would require the state to consider total cost of ownership over the lifetime of a vehicle when making procurement decisions. The Electrification Coalition worked with the Department of Administration to conduct an analysis of a portion of the Nevada State Fleet using our dashboard for rapid vehicle electrification, the total cost of ownership tool, and found that by considering uh, total cost of ownership and procurement decisions, electrifying 92% of the vehicles we analyzed would create savings for the state of Nevada without the need for any rebates or grants. Uh, I've submitted additional information as written testimony and sent each of you a copy of our analysis for your review. Uh, we'd be happy to meet with you and discuss further our analysis and how uh, total cost of ownership and fleet electrification can more efficiently use Nevada taxpayer dollars and help to establish Nevada as a leader in the future of electric vehicle supply chain. Thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. My name is Melissa Ramos, and I'm the Senior Manager of Clean Air Advocacy with the American Lung Association. We advocate for policies that reduce air pollution and protect human health. Assembly Bill 262 will encourage the adoption of zero emission vehicles in the state fleet procurement process. This will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce the health risks associated with emissions from vehicles. Our 2023 State of the Air report found about 35% of Americans breathe unhealthy air, and for Nevadans, it's significantly worse. 93% of Nevadans live in a community with polluted air. Air pollution harms lung and heart health, causing heart attacks, strokes, worsened asthma attacks, and premature deaths. These health risks are heightened even more for our most vulnerable populations, including low-income, communities of color, children, and seniors. We know that emissions from the transportation sector represent the largest source of Nevada's air and climate burdens, and transitioning to zero emission vehicles and clean energy could yield up to $7.5 billion in public health benefits in Nevada over the coming, over the coming decades, according to our Zeroing In on Healthy Air report. Clean air and a safe climate are important for healthy lungs, and although we've made incredible progress to clean up harmful air pollution, too many communities are still waiting for clean air. We urge you to vote in favor of AB 262 so the state can lead the transition away from fossil fuels, clean up air pollution, and foster healthy communities. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. And if somebody's already stated your argument, please feel free to say diddle. Uh, um, don't feel obligated to read your entire statement. Uh, next caller in support, please. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. I said that way too late. <laughs> um, 
BPS will stay on the phone. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition of AB 23262, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Is there anybody wishing to testify in opposition? Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, BPS will go back to you. Anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 262, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Any closing remarks you may have, Assemblyman? With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 262. And the only remaining item on the agenda is public comment. Anybody wishing to join us for public comment, Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, BPS, does anybody wish to join us for public comment over the phone? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Members, I anticipate Wednesday and Friday being equally as uh, chaotic as today um, and probably much longer. It is, again, my intention for us to meet earlier than our normal start time of 3.30. However, that's contingent on the two committees that meet immediately prior to us, which is judiciary and education. Assuming they end early on Wednesday, we'll give ourselves a small five-minute gap and immediately come into uh, Senate Government Affairs, although that may not happen. Um, but it just I, I ask for everybody to remain flexible, but I understand that Everybody has a thousand things happening, but that, that's the intention. Also, we have a work session document scheduled for Wednesday. Depending on whether or not we have all members here, that's going to determine whether or not we do that first and or last. So again, I just ask that you remain fluid and uh, flexible, and we'll make this work, uh, and we'll close out this very frustrating week as it tends to be. With that, uh, this meeting's adjourned.